that has taken place in Tragedy. The story goes that a war veteran killed his own mother, his own wife, his own son, and then took away his own life. You don't have to belong to that community to feel with them. Just to know about that painful loss just hits somewhere. It hurts. And I'm sure the people of Trachidae are asking the question, what went wrong? And not just the people of Trachidae. Those of us that have heard the story, those of us that are touched by it, are also saying, how could it have been affected? It should never have happened. And in fact, it is said, in the history of that community, and perhaps the whole of Canada, such a thing as that has never, ever taken place. What caused it? Those questions are being asked. There are suggestions. He could have been better attended to after his leaving with armed forces. Perhaps someone should have been alert and just following him around, so on and so forth. But what it has called for is to stop and ask, should this go on, or should there be a stop to it? What is it that is causing it, and how can we bring it to an end? We can relate this to what happens in many a business. The successful businesswoman stops a man and asks himself, herself, how is my business running? It is the student who pauses and asks himself or herself, what is my performance like? It is the worker who will also take stock of what is going on around him. What is good and what is bad that is able to build on his work and prosper because you're not working haphazardly. Don't we realize the church should also stop and check itself? The whole year is gone, the new has come. Should we keep on being the same, doing the same, carrying on as we've carried on before? As somebody has said, if I go to my doctor because of an infection, and he gives me an antibiotic that does not work, I'll go back to him. That's why he tells me, come back after so long, we see how effective this medicine is. If it's not, let's reach, read, do the whole thing, and check, and try another. And if his work doesn't quite perform, many a physician are not tired of saying, look for a second opinion. Or we ourselves say, I'll, think I'll, I'll ask somebody else to give me another opinion. We don't want to do things that keep us backward or make us stand where we are and don't take us forward. And the church is one place where we frequently ought to stop and ask ourselves, what will take us forward? For if there is any institution that should go forward, it certainly should be the church. It is the place where God has chosen, as our text says, to make his name be born, be understood, and to shine forth to an unknown world that God may be known. And Nehemiah does that for us very well. Tell me. Let's begin with him and see how he just begins at that place where he identifies himself as one among God's people, doesn't he? Hmm. Are we jumping the gun too fast? He says he was a cup bearer. What does that to do? So he was in a foreign land. He was serving a foreign king. He was not even in his own territory. And yet this is the man who is moved to move from the foreign land to go his own native land and rectify things there. 
if you do well to learn some lessons from the story of Nehemiah. And four of them will suffice for this evening. He begins by showing us the exact state that his people were in. He says, they were small in number. It's a remnant. It's a people that had gone off course. And because they had gone off course, the God who they served said, you will remain off course and off my land. That's how God treated them. Oh, how cruel of God. I mean, it's not cruel of God to tell a disobedient people, your disobedience has consequences. And so that's the consequence. They were scattered and remained a remnant because they had gone into exile. But notice also how they suffered. They were in trouble. We are in big trouble. They were in distress. They were also in shame because as they were reproached. So here it is, small in number, suffering, and shamed because they can't stand as themselves. Their wrongdoing has taken the better of them. And if you like, their enemies have silenced them. And none of us want to go in that territory. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to be shamed. We don't want to be silenced. We want our voices heard. And we want to be known for who we are. That's why we cry quite often. You don't even understand me. We want to be understood for who we understand ourselves to be. But have we looked at the Baptist, the past United Baptist Church? And have we asked ourselves, where do we stand? And how well do we stand in our relationship with God? How much are we drawn close to our God and living in such obedience to him that he is pouring upon us tolerance of blessing. Now each one of us can begin to picture our understanding. We can say, Hasbro is doing really, really well. Or we can say, Oof, we have a long way to go. Or you might say, I just don't know. I just go to church. All I do is the Sunday comes, I'm in church, then I'm out. Then I wish for the world. You know where you are. But you see, Nehemiah chose to examine his people and to see exactly where they were. And where did that lead him? This brings us to our second thought. This brings us to the place where not only does he see the state in which those people are, he actually looks up to the God who is bigger than these people. But then to appreciate that, here's where he begins. He acknowledges that God is big. For does he not say about himself, I sat down. If he says I sat down, then he was defeated. Then he says, I mourned and I wept. Your spirit dampened. The, the difficulty was overwhelming. And you see, it's because of that that says, now I began to fast and to pray. I realized that my strength was not in me. It had to be on the outside of me. That would bring redemption to these people. And then he, in the passages, he sees his God, the God of heaven. As you look at each one of us here, can you see everybody here is very encouraging. Everybody here is very stimulating. Everybody here is very inspirational. And I wish that I was like that one of them, like that one of that one of that one. Or you pause and say, ah, uh, uh, yeah, that kind of faith. <laughs> that, ah, uh, no. You see, it is up to each one of us to so live the Christian life 
that people begin to admire us for who we are. The pastor looks at you and says, I wish I was like that one. Who? As some pastor would say, there are some church members who when I look at, I see Jesus in them. The pastor saying that? Yes. It's not the pastor to be adorned in the Christ likeness and the rest of the congregation to be everything else. It's each one of us to be who God wants us to be. And the man who ministers to you should only be an example. Who should seek to be what Paul says, imitate me as I am an imitator of who? Christ. So that you follow only that which is Christ-like in him. When you see that which is not Christ-like, you say, I'm not going to be a part of that. I'll be only a part of that which is Christ-like. But who among us is like that? But we begin to see that our weaknesses have taken us away from that place where we should glow with the glory and beauty and majesty of the God of heaven. And so we need a microscope to see the presence of God in each one of us. And that is how some of us, if we say, are you going to heaven today? <laughs> I'm not too sure. We begin to scratch ourselves. Why shouldn't I be sure? Why shouldn't you be sure? I don't know what I'm doing. You should know what you are doing. When did you ever get employed and say, employ me, but I don't know what I'm doing? You will be sucked immediately. And even those of us who call ourselves God's people, we should know who we are and what we are doing. And that is how we are able to sell ourselves to the others with conviction. And this is what Nehemiah is drawing his people to. We have lost our position. Hence the shame and the suffering and the silence and the agony of it all. But we can come back. We can come back if we understand our God to be big. And he is. But let's not talk, stop there. See how Nehemiah brings us in the third place. To the place where he confesses not only his sin, but everybody's sin. Now that is, should stand you and me. Nehemiah has not done anything wrong. On the contrary, he is the one who has seen what the people of God have done by way of going wrong. And he seeks to bring them back. But notice what he says. I understand that I am your servant, O oh God. And I understand that your people are also your servants. But I do realize that we've not given you the service we should. Notice, he's not taking himself out. He's actually taking part in what has happened in the lives of his people. And he's saying, we have sinned. He doesn't say, they have sinned. That one says, we. How many of us identify ourselves with the weaknesses of this church and are carried along with the others and we don't say they, you say we have failed your God. We have not done what we should. We. Because we are good servants. And better than that, when we have become Christians in the deeper sense of the word, more than servants, we are God's children, sons and daughters. And Nehemiah says, we have not reflected that. Look at the picture he paints. A remnant, a suffering, and the walls of Jerusalem are what? Okay. Broken down. And they've been burnt. Now walls may mean next to nothing. Maybe if you are Trump, they'll mean something. Because between the states and Mexico, there'll be that big wall. Huh? In Africa, they mean a lot. If you don't have a big fence, you feel very insecure. You know, all the, one of the shocks we come with, we, we, since when we come to Canada, those of us who have been in these underdeveloped countries, is to see how we pack cars just carelessly like that. Oh, you can't do that in Africa. You won't find it. You are in town, you just you turn your back against the car and lock. Either what is inside stolen or somebody is driving it away from you. It's as bad as that. You see, the fences may mean nothing. But for those who know that, yeah, three fences will safeguard their vehicle, they will do that. And in those days, the fence was a sign of security. What is our fence as pastor in United Baptist Church? It's the word of God. But if I were to ask each one of us here, 
Tell me three verses only from Genesis. Ah, uh, Genesis. Where do I find Genesis? We, we might even do Genesis. Some people have flat pages. Genesis. You're looking for Genesis. Really? Genesis. And they begin flapping pages. Oh, let's find Hezekiah. Oh, you begin. Hezekiah was not a boy. It was a king. But see how shallow we are in our work? My Christianity is only up to the level to which I know the word of God. And this is the bulwark by which we are built and defend what God has deposited into us. But how many of us can say we know the word? Some of us say, when I was in Sunday school, I knew so many verses. You should know many more now that you're even older. But see how we struggle. Yes, we do. But that should be the natural outflow of our life. Thy word have I hidden in my heart, what? That I may not sin against you. Do we see this as a weakness amongst us? And we begin to say, God, we want your help to get over this weakness. Because let's face it, when we can get into the word, we'll get into prayer, we'll get into evangelism, we'll get into sparkling for God. And everybody will say, what's, what's happening at the Pastor Church? Everybody seems to be bubbling, they're fiery, they're excited. There's this thing in them that seems to be just unique to them. Who doesn't want that? That's what we need to show the outlooking world. Because God is a sparkle in the lives of his own people. And when Nehemiah doesn't see it in the lives of his people, it hurts and says, God, we have sinned. How many of us tonight will begin praying, God, we have sinned? And look at how the whole thing ends. For he cries to this God. Which God? It's the God of heaven. Which God? It is the God who has chosen to let his name be among his people. So see how Nehemiah appeals to God on the passion he has for his people. And not only that passion, you know, sometimes we feel and then we become powerless. You know, I feel, but I'm too powerless. Well, most of us have been there. I feel for you, but I can't do anything about it. But he's one who feels and can do something. And so he appeals to the God who has this passion and who has this power. And why should this God do it? He should purify these people. For he says, you, we have been unfaithful servants. And remember your covenant with us. It's the covenant that says, I'll teach you my ways and I'll keep you my ways. And if those men break it, God doesn't. Even though many people fail, God doesn't. And Nehemiah appeals to God on that premise. And the story goes on. In the next few weeks, we'll be looking at the depth of that story and see how it builds up. But see how the answer comes. He just says, give me favor in the sight of this king. So God may give us favor in the sight of our families, in the sight of our communities, so that we begin to come through. There will, there will be opposition. But the opposition will see that they are opposing us because they can see that something that is divine is working through us and wanting to lift up the name of God. Don't you want that? Let's take stock of what's going on here. Let's confess our weakness and bring in the God of strength. And let's see what he can do for the part of our church. I know you want that. That's why you're here tonight. Meeting in the evening would have been an even bigger excuse. But here you are, serious people. God bless you. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the good man, Nehemiah, who did see through the weaknesses of his people that God would show himself mighty so that they will come through victorious in the strength of their God. And we know you've given us this word so that we might learn that you want to get over our weaknesses and with the strength, the ability in us that fulfill the will of God in this lost world so that it may be understood even now that our God is alive and at work in the lives of obedient people. So search in our hearts, try us and see our thoughts. 
All there is in us, individually and collectively, that you despise, take away from us and give us the heart to build the wall of God, the strength of your word hidden in our heart, that we may do the bidding of our God. Even as your son taught us, now we cry to you, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For yours is the kingdom, the power of the glory, forever and ever. Amen.